Hello, friends. So um, I have decided to actually start a uh, podcast from now on, and hopefully I will have your support. Uh, this is my first podcast. I've done a lot of lives before on the various issues, um, and I plan to do this on a regular basis. Uh, so this is my first podcast, and uh, wish me well, everyone. Um, today we have a special guest uh he is a good friend of mine, a community activist, uh, and uh, I think student of historian, if I'm correct. Uh, like, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, student of history, sorry, not a historian. Uh, so he is Zakir Hussain. He lives in uh, East London. And we will be uh, discussing uh, Bangladesh, the history and migration of Bangladesh, Bangladesh is around the world. Uh, so... Zakir Bhai, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you for uh, having me, Rahul Bhai. This is the first time I'm actually presenting. I usually go on uh, different uh, talk shows and I'm usually Thank the you. guest, but today I'm, I'm presenting happy. and you're the guest. Uh, so it's a new experience for me. Uh, so welcome to the program and uh, hopefully, you, you know, uh, this is going to be something uh, which will continue uh, for a long time. And uh, the whole purpose is to actually, you know, pass on the information, pass on stats, information, history, uh, especially to the young generation of Bangladeshis and generally to the public. Uh, so the topic today will be uh, Bangladesh, the country, the history uh, and the migration and the impact Bangladesh had uh, around the world and Bangladeshis have around the world. So um, if I can ask you, if you can uh, kindly sort of introduce yourself, uh, your background and say, a bit about uh, uh, Bangladesh, how you see Bangladesh from your perspective as a young Bengali living in UK. Over to Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Rahul Bhai, first of all. Thank you for doing this um, um, you know, podcast because uh, I think it's very important uh, for our new generation to know the history of Bangladesh and what it means to be Bangladeshi. So a bit of background about myself. Um, so as you already introduced me, my name is Zakir Hussain. I've lived in Shadwell for... 33 years now. Um, I'm a student of uh, history. Um, I have graduated from the University of Greenwich um, and my um, uh, degree was in uh, business uh, administration and that was quite a while back now. Um, and the reason why um, I'm really interested in this particular topic is um, there was a conversation I had with a uh, cousin of mine. This was you know, probably five, six years back. Um, and we were talking about uh, the history of Bangladesh and um, how you know Bangladesh was uh, very different to what we see it now. So I happened to mention and say, "Oh, uh, Bangladesh was actually the richest country, or including West Bengal, in the world at one stage." And this cousin of mine started laughing, laughing in a way that you know, what do you mean, Bangladesh can't be? Mm. So I think why it's so important for us to understand our history is we've always, always been a very, very rich country. Now, Bangladesh, yes, prior to 1971, the name Bangladesh didn't exist, I understand, but the area of Bangladesh, the region, was called ancient Bengal. So that includes parts of um, so all of West, ben West Bengal, Bihar, and uh, Tri uh, Tripura, and Mirzoram, basically all around uh, what we see Bangladesh today. And the, funnily enough, the, uh, the uh, Rohingya, where they lived, the Arakan Kingdom, was actually all part of um, the ancient uh, ancient. So it has a very rich history. It's, uh, it was known throughout um, Europe as well. Uh, the ancient Greeks in the 8th century BCE, so that's 2,800, 2800 years ago, in the Homeric period, um, there was uh, songs um, and uh, sort of poems uh, which were dedicated to Jason, his Argonauts, and the Golden Fleece. It's called Greek mythology, but with a lot of myth. There are stories um, that do have truths in them. So if you have a character who's been mentioned from thousands of miles away in a, in a very uh, known uh, epic, if you want to be a poem or a, or a, or a journey, such as Jason, um, his Argonauts and the Golden Fleece, you're left with questioning why would they choose a character, a person, a chieftain, a warlord, all the way from Bangladesh until or that what logically follows is that back in those days, there was a lot of wars, there was a lot of uh, rivalry, but there was also a lot of uh, 
what's called um, uh, truces or um, how could I put it, um, arrangements between you know, different uh, uh, sort of tribes or different uh, armies. Um, so when you follow the history, you see that um, in where Alexander the Great, his area, Macedonia, those sort of areas, that was quite active back in, you know, 2,800 years ago, 2,500 years ago. And the Ganga Ridai Kingdom, so with this character called Datis, he was from the Ganga Ridai Kingdom. Um, so it leaves one wondering, why would you have a character being, you know, uh, sung about in poems all the way in Greece? You have to... And then when I started reading about the Ganga Ridai Kingdom, they were very active, very powerful at the time of the Homeric period, Alexander the Great. So moving from 8th century BCE, when you know the Europeans mentioned uh, the uh, the power of the Ganga Ridai Kingdom, and again, the Ganga Ridai Kingdom included all of Bangladesh and its surrounding areas. So if we were to now move, do let me know, uh, Rulbai, if you want me to stop, if you have any questions, yeah, or sure. if you want me to... Yeah. So if we were to move from the 8th century BCE, uh, and if we were to move to the, uh, the third century. Now, there is a Greek historian by the name of Megasthenes. Now, he was born roughly uh, 350 BCE, and he uh, died in 290 BCE. That is the time when Alexander the Great uh, was conquering lands. Alexander the Great died in 322 at the age of 32. So this Megasthenes person was actually similar age to Alexander the Great when he wrote and he mentioned uh, about um, the Ganga Ridai Kingdom. He mentioned about the Ganges, how big it was, how wide it was. And um, although history tells us that Alexander the Great conquered parts of India, um, even if we say for argument's sake that is true, but what is recorded in history is that he did not feel strong enough. He was scared to cross the Ganges because in the writing of the Greeks, According to Megasthenes, who is quoted by Diodorus Siculus in the first century BCE, another Greek, in his books he quotes uh, Megasthenes, and his book is called the um, uh, let's see the, the uh, history uh, history of the world. Uh, I can't remember the full uh, Greek name, uh, but if you were to just type in Google Diodorus Siculus and me mention of Gangari their kingdom, he actually uh, you know details exactly you know the Ganges plains and the, the armies and according to his history he says that that army was never defeated at that time so so it, it seems that um, in terms of recorded history uh, the area of Bangladesh had such powerful armies and again logically if we look at it um, it's a very fertile land probably the most fertile land in, you know in the world so if you have agriculture back in those days you know, uh, wheat, uh, rice, all of these were, you know, used as commodities to trade. So if you had a very fertile land, naturally you'll be rich. Also, what's mentioned in the uh, uh, Greek uh, uh, history books when they describe Bangalore their kingdom is that um, the they had war elephants, war elephants, and not one, not two, mm -hmm. 4,000 ready war elephants. These were trained. They had 80,000 horses. Now, this is not from any Bangladeshi historian. So just to make it very clear, not from any Indian historian. This is from Greek historians who have no benefit in talking so highly of another land. As a historian, a lot of people would say, oh, this historian has a bias. But it's clear that they have no, they have no interest in saying good things about the Ganga Ridai Kingdom. How does it benefit them? Unless it actually occurred. So... Just by looking at the early stages, you know, you know before the, uh, say, if you want to call it the birth of uh, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, and you look at the history of the Ganga Ridai Kingdom, they were very powerful, and these were Bengali people. Mm. Now, a lot of people will probably look at themselves today and say, well, hang on, the Bengalis are not really, you know, uh, how can I say, that tall. And, you know, you know the way people automatically think, oh, you have to be tall and big to be able to, you know, uh, be strong. But... Uh, that doesn't necessarily always have to be the case. The other argument is that back in those days, yes, the Bangladesh, as you see now, due to obviously poverty and uh, malnutrition following the British Raj, um, the people back then were a lot stronger. Our ancestors were a lot stronger uh, in terms of military might. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we ourselves as Bangladeshis 
uh, need to understand our own history uh, to know what our forefathers achieved, how they were. Uh, because, as I said, my interest um, in really learning more about it and getting detailed on this subject was when my cousin started laughing and just thought, you know, this is strange <laughs> for a Bangladeshi to laugh at. Why? Mm. Because we're so used to seeing poverty mm. and, um, you know, political instability defining Bangladesh. And that's just the last 50 years. What about, you know, three, 4,000 years? So I think we're really doing injustice to our history if we don't uh, really search uh, beyond the 50 years since Bangladesh has been born. Yeah, so what, what, uh, when did you decide to sort of, uh, you know, read Bangladesh history? Or what made you sort of read Bangladesh history? That's my question. So I think for me, I've always been interested in history. I've always, I mean, since I was, uh, I would say, 10, 11, um, my you know, a variety of, uh, sort of uh, teachers uh, and fellow students, um, I was always in, uh, interested in history purely because the teachers would always say, if you do not know where you have come from, how do you know where you're going? And there was another saying, again, um, I remember a scholar, an Islamic scholar, saying that um, through colonization, one of the things that they wanted to do is separate the people from their history. Because if they don't know where they've come from, what they've achieved, really? you can sell them anything. You can tell them anything. You can say, look, your forefathers couldn't do much. So naturally, you won't be able to do much. So it's another way of mentally controlling. So it was, you know, from that age, probably 12, 30, I decided to start learning about where I've come from. What, what does it mean to be Bangladeshi? Mm. And it was really a lot of uh, self-interest and just seeing the plight of, you know, people in Bangladesh and even, you know, within Tahamlet Hamlets where I grew up. Mm. Um, and naturally, I would say to myself, why is it that our country or our people are in this situation that we see, we see them, uh, themselves in? And then that started, you know, uh, my journey on uh, learning by history. And what I uncovered or found in the history books, it's a it's a total opposite of how we see Bangladesh or how we see the situation in Bangladesh or how we see the Bangladeshi people at the moment. Mm. Um, so I, I do feel if we do not learn about it, we're cheating ourselves. So it was it was through that actually uh, that one statement: if you do not know what, what your history is or where you've come from, mm. you cannot possibly know where you're going. And I don't want to live my life um, in a way where I'm not certain about where I've come from. And, you know, that would, wouldn't would allow me to actually have a clear picture of where I'm going. So it's about self-identity, knowing about what our forefathers did. Um, and it's something that I always had an interest in. So it's a few conversations here, uh, you know, uh, my teachers at an early age, you know, just, just using that phrase to say, if you do not know, you know where you've come from, you can't possibly know where you're going. And that struck a chord with me. And I think since then, I really don't. I mean, I've spent, you know, many years. I would say probably over twenty-five years now, just you know, self-teaching, self-teaching, you know, mm-hmm. reading books, uh, and also what I did as well is I don't look at just the Bangladeshi sources or Indian sources. I always try and find other sources where it becomes clear that they have no benefit in saying something good about another tribe or another uh, army or another kingdom. So it was interesting to find that. Um, it was the Gangarudai kingdom that was being spoken very high, but not any other kingdoms around. You had China, you had India, you had uh, all of Ind- you know, Indochina area, Thailand. But the Greeks do not mention anyone as highly as they do the Gangarudai kingdom. And when I read that, my interest grew and grew. And uh, as I said, uh, you know, since then, I've just been learning about it more and more, looking at different sources. No, I'm truly impressed, uh, Zagir Bhai. Um, uh, kudos to you, because uh, from my experience, I grew up in this country as well, and uh, uh, most uh, people, uh, you know, uh, will not know the uh, in-depth history that you've just mentioned, and even I don't know a lot of it. I know a lot of this stuff in a nutshell, like uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, used to be one of the most uh, richest uh, areas of uh, India uh, when the British went. Uh, 500 years ago, uh, Bangladesh was the richest area, uh, which was actually, uh, uh, I think, mentioned by uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. I'm sure most people would know yeah. the international uh, scholar. And also, uh, it's already uh, uh, recorded that a uh, thousand years ago, uh, apparently uh, the Chinese used to come to Bengal for, for trading and learning purposes. So there's a lot 
to be proud of, like, you know, uh, in terms of uh, being a Bengali person and Bangladeshi. But it's very, uh, you know, uh, it's a very sad state of affairs and very unfortunate that uh, a lot of the young generation nowadays don't seem to know the history. And uh, they're interesting that, but, as well. <laughs> yeah. And one thing, I, 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 even uh, in Bangladesh, when I go to Bangladesh, I find that uh, even in Bangladesh, a lot of the young generation, they don't know their history. Uh, it's just not uh, given enough emphasis in the education system or generally. Uh, I find from my experience, um, I think there should be more emphasis on Bangladesh history. Um, in Bangladesh, what I found, like uh, students tend to know more about European history, yes. <laughs> American history than, you know, Bangladesh history. So I think that that's something that, they, you know, Bangladesh needs to think about. Uh, even in this country, like uh, even parents can play a, like a big role, like Absolutely. teaching the Absolutely. children. Um, uh, and... Uh, Another thing, like uh, I, uh, you know, obviously I go to Bangladesh because I like Bang Bangladesh. I like the weather, you know. Um, then, yeah. I grew up here, but I was born in Bangladesh. But uh, there's uh, so many things uh, which I like about Bangladesh. I like the weather, you know. I like uh, the people, very humble people. I like Sheikh Hamza said, uh, you know, um, and very hardworking. You know, if it wasn't for the hardworking population, we we, we would not have uh, become a very, uh, you know, um, poor thinking nation, you know. Absolutely. Let alone like 250 years ago or 500 years ago, or even 1,000 years ago. Uh, so I think uh, parents need to play a greater role. And, uh, you know, if, if parents uh, play a greater role, then uh, people, children uh, would be more interested in going and seeing the ancestral land. You know, Absolutely. I'm not saying people, you know, people have to migrate or settle there, but at least have the interest to go back and forth, you know, and see the ancestral land. Um, uh, we see a lot of uh, Bangladeshis who live in the UK go to different parts of the world, you know, to visit different countries. But uh, when it comes to Bangladesh, there's no interest. You know, personally, I, I take my children and, uh, you know, you'd be surprised they actually like Bangladesh. We go every year. Oh. Yeah, we go every year. And uh, uh, the reason is uh, why a lot of people, a lot of children don't want to go is because, uh, you know, when people go to Bangladesh with their kids, uh, they tend to just stay in their villages, in the yeah. rural areas. Whereas with me, what I tend to do is I, I tend to take them around, like around Silet and outside of Silet. I go to the capital, I go to Chittagong, I go to Cox's Bazaar. You know, we go on a full-on tour. Like in 2019, uh, like me and my wider family, my sisters, my brothers, we all went. I think there was 22 of us and we did a Bangladesh tour. I think you know, okay. I've never met another family in the UK who done a similar tour. I don't know of any. Uh, and the funny thing is, like, I'm the only one who likes Bangladesh uh, in my siblings, yeah? And after that tour, you'd be surprised, like, by, like, the perception they had about Bangladesh, that Bangladesh is very dangerous, Bangladesh is very dirty, Bangladesh is this, Bangladesh is that. Um, the whole perception changed, honestly. They love Bangladesh. Wow. And they say that that trip in 2019 was the trip of a lifetime, honestly. Wow. And, uh, you know, all of them have been back since, yeah, on the road. Yeah. But that was a trip, you know, um, uh, as a family visit. 22 of us, like we went to, first we went to Dhaka, then we went to um, Sundarbans, you know, which is a wow. very unique place around the world. You know, I'm sure you know this, yeah? Sundarbans is a Bengal, unique, the home of the Bengal tiger. Yeah, UNESCO registered, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, Heritage type. Yeah, forest. And um, a lot of people from around the world actually go to Sundarbans to see the um, uh, the uh, all the wildlife, you know, which you won't see in any other part of the world. So we went to Sundarban and then we came back to Dhaka. It was a very whirlwind tour. We spent about 20 days in Bangladesh, came back from uh, Sundarbans, went to um, Chittagong, and then from Chittagong we went to Bandarban. From Bandarban, uh -huh. um, we, uh, hold on, I've just got a message. Uh, we will have to end very soon. We've got another 10 minutes. So from Bandar, okay. when we came back, uh, we went to um, Cox's Bazaar. From Cox's Bazaar, came to Dhaka, from Dhaka to Silet. And the perception uh, that they had, all of my siblings, that uh, in Bangladesh was very dangerous, it's not safe. But uh, honestly, you know, they loved it and they felt more safer in Bangladesh than other parts of the world, believe me, or even safer than UK. <laughs> There's yes. hardly any police. You hardly see any police. You hardly see any yes. ambulances in the major cities, uh, especially yeah, in the rural I... areas. You know, they, the there's hardly world. any crime. And things yeah. have changed. Obviously, like uh, 20, 30 years ago, I can understand it was a developing country. 
But now it's a middle income, a lower middle income country, and uh, things are really moving. Like even the uh, uh, the economy is actually growing at like something like seven to eight percent every year. You know, and Bangladesh is being talked talked about uh, at a larger forums like the World Economic Forum. They're actually you know uh, praising Bangladesh for their policies. You know, uh, Bangladesh has uplifted poverty, uh, millions of people from poverty in the last sort of. Uh, Decade, uh, decade, decade or two, and it's, it's totally it's about it. I would highly urge uh, you know the young generation and families to go and visit. Honestly, it's such a safe place, such a I, place. And there's like a, a, another thing I realized as a traveler, as a person who travels a lot, I usually go to the, I usually go out of the country four or five times a year. But what I find is like Bangladesh has a lot of uh, you know uh, parks now, like wildlife parks, theme parks. There's plenty. Bangladesh has the biggest shopping center in Southeast Asia, like Jumuna Park, you know, it's the biggest uh, uh, in Dhaka. And then Bangladesh has the biggest water park in South Asia. You know, uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. There's so many things to be proud of. Bangladesh is the second largest uh, uh, garments exporter. Bangladesh is the third largest fish exporter uh, wow. in you know, around the world, you know, so that is something to celebrate, isn't it? Exactly. Would you, you know, would you uh, say uh, these things we don't really appreciate? And also, like um, we know that India is leading in terms of IT. India has the largest IT uh, literate people around the world, and we know that mm -hmm. India produces uh, almost ninety percent of the software that we use on a day to day basis. And believe me or not, after India, it is Bangladesh who has the next, the second highest number of literal uh, IT literate people. Uh, in Bangladesh, you know, and uh, but yeah. it's, it's it's sad actually uh, because obviously there's a scarcity of jobs within IT, and uh, Bangladesh is doing its best. Uh, it's actually building uh, IT parks in every single uh, district as we speak. So hopefully, in five ten years time, uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh will be able to give jobs to a lot of these people. Uh, we have something like I think six hundred fifty thousand. Um, I think that was uh, five years ago. That's that's the stat. Yeah. Six hundred fifty thousand IT literate people, and these people are actually. Uh, currently, what what they are doing, they do do a lot of freelancing work. Yeah, so okay. uh, they do earn good money. I have a lot of uh, cousins uh, who are into this business. Um, they're qualified and uh, they actually work uh, as a self-employed person, uh, do uh, doing freelancing, whatever they do, um, and they get the uh, employment uh, through various websites uh, from the internet. And uh, yeah, so I can see Bangladesh actually going from uh, strength to strength in terms of IT. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, and uh, obviously Bangladesh needs to create a lot of jobs for uh, you know uh, the young uh, IT literates. And also uh, one thing I've uh, realized that Bangladesh really needs to uh, focus on is the uh, language. Uh, obviously, if we are to uh, sort of uh, trade with the world. Uh, trade, you know, uh, get jobs around the world. You know, now, nowadays uh, we live in the 21st century. We don't literally have to travel. We, you can actually yeah. work, you know, online. You know, you can be anywhere and work for a company, like any multinational company. So, um, so language is a big barrier. So um, I've been sort of trying to, uh, you know, uh, promote uh uh, the English language because English language is the international language. It's a business language that you know most countries yeah. understand. Um, I know as Bengalis we're very proud of our language. Because Bangladesh yes. is the only country around the world who actually achieved their independence. Uh, yes, language movement. You know this is something to be very proud of. And Bangladesh and the Bengali language is the sweetest language recognized by UNESCO. Wow. You know, wow. uh, so this is really something to be proud of as well. Uh, so I can see Bangladesh going, uh, you know, uh, uh, strength to strength, going places, and uh, Bangladesh. Uh, I can see Bangladesh becoming a, uh, a economic powerhouse uh, in twenty years' time. It is already predicted to become a developed country by twenty forty, even if it grows wow. at the current levels. So you can wow. imagine Bangladesh has, uh, you know, like uh, a, a lot of things to celebrate. And uh, the, so that that's one thing I think uh, Bangladesh needs to concentrate on. Like it needs to make. English as a second official language, like mm -hmm. India. If you look at India, like because of the language, uh, every single state has its uh, uh, own language, and then English will be the second official language. And as a result, look where India is right now. India is le literally leading the IT world around the world. Yeah. So yeah. we can be the second player 
uh, in the globe. You know, but we need to call, you know concentrate on the English language, and that's where a lot of the uh, young um, IT literates actually uh, have difficulties in getting employment or even trading, yeah. setting up businesses. You know, uh, so that's one thing that Bangladesh needs to uh, concentrate. If you even if you look at countries like uh, Philippines, Indonesia, because of the language, look, they are actually because the country can't actually produce enough jobs. These yeah. people of those countries tend to go to different countries around the world. For instance, uh, uh, in Middle East, like Dubai, Saudi, uh, even in the UK or Europe, uh, a lot of the Philippines and uh, Indonesians uh, find it uh, a lot more easier to get jobs because of the language, because uh, English yeah. is widely spoken in those uh, you know, countries. So I, I believe like Bangladesh has a very good future and uh, we can go, we can become an economic powerhouse uh, around the world. I really believe that. And I think uh, my message is uh, mainly to parents, like to actually uh, educate uh, your children and yeah. take children to Bangladesh. Uh, now and then, not every year. I know it's very uh, expensive going to Bangladesh, especially yeah. with those great gifts we have to give to our relatives. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's one thing going to Turkey or Morocco or in Europe. You know, you just book a package for a day and go. But when you go to Bangladesh, it's a total package. You know, <laughs> <Big suitcases. laughs> the accommodation, the food, and all the gifts you have to give, the money you have to give to you know relatives. Uh, as well. so <laughs> it is expensive but uh, you know uh, nowadays like bangladesh uh, dhaka silet has really really good hotels and resorts where you can stay okay. when i went with my family even last year we stayed in mainly we stayed in our village only for two days and most of the time i was there for three weeks we were staying in resorts and hotels and they loved it so yeah. that's uh, that's the thing that I think people need to do, and as a result, Bangladesh and we need to promote Bangladesh. Like even yes. the Indian Prime Minister, I like, think recently when he went on a worldwide tour, he was telling people, his own people, to tell others to come to India. So we need to. Uh, we are all ambassadors for Bangladesh. So we need to tell our friends and family, uh, you know, to go to Bangladesh. Even you know, friends from other cultures. Yeah. Uh, to yeah. go to Bangladesh and visit Bangladesh, and by you know by doing that, we'll be promoting Bangladesh and Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh tourism basically. So and uh, yeah. you know this is a beautiful country, you know, uh, six seasons. Um, there's so many things we can say, but obviously time is running out. We've only got uh, another uh, minute, so we'll have to wrap up the program. So uh, thank you, Zakir Bhai, for your in-depth um, you know analysis into Bangladesh history. Um, obviously. Uh, we'll be continuing this subject. Uh, we'll be coming back to this subject and we'll be discussing other subjects. Mainly the whole podcast is to sort of educate people and inform people basically uh, about subjects of the day, basically, or issues of the day. And uh, special thanks to all the audience uh, who've been watching. And please do comment, like, and also share this program. So at least I'll have some motivation. I don't get any financial benefit by doing this. It's just to... Um, uh, empower, motivate, and uh, inform people. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you, Zakir Bhai. Thank you. Uh, until the next program, see you again. Thank you. Thanks.